a high savings rate for financial independence will overcome a lot of stupid mistakes mm -hmm. during the 15 or 20 years that you're trying to reach financial independence. You don't have to beat yourself up for spilling your latte on your desk and, and go without it. You can go buy another one if that's what you want to do <laughs> without beating yourself up over making a mistake like that. Welcome to the Military Money Manual Podcast. Hello, podcast listeners. Spencer here, founder of MilitaryMoneyManual.com and author of the new book, The Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom. I'm here again today with my co-host, Jamie. And today we have a special guest, Doug Nordman from The Military Guide. Our podcast is all about achieving financial independence while you serve in the military. We believe that personal finance shouldn't be boring or intimidating. And the only real financial goal worth pursuing is financial independence. And you can achieve financial independence within 10 to 20 years of starting your journey to FI. And now a special episode with Doug Norman from The Military Guide. Our guest today is Doug Nordman, the founder of The Military Guide. That's the-military-guide.com. Doug is the OG or original gangster <laughs> of military fire movement. Doug, welcome. We're so glad that you could join us today on the podcast. Thanks, Spencer. Good to see you, Jamie. I'm looking forward to hearing Rich uh, Carey's episode when you guys release that. Yeah, well, we'll we're looking forward to uh, Rich has, what Rich has to say as well. I can see it. But uh, Doug, why don't you take us through your military career and... Um, just kind of tell us who you are, where you are now, and um, what your journey to financial independence was like. And now that you're on the other side of FI, reaching FI, what that's like. Sounds good. I, uh, I joined the Navy when I started college, and I commissioned uh, in 1982. Uh, my spouse also commissioned in 1983. So we were a dual military couple for most of our careers. And during the first 10 years, we did all the typical junior officer stuff. But in 1992, 10 years into it, we started our family. And I was on shore duty at the time, and I expected that life was going to get better. But it was more like a 60-hour work week on shore duty that I had already experienced on sea duty, and the trend was bothering me. Right. Uh, but I also realized that we'd had a fairly high savings rate over the time that we'd been on active duty. So we were looking forward to working a typical career where you get a job after the Navy because, you know, you can't possibly have enough to live on after the military. That, that was legend at the time. But at the same time, we realized we had a high savings rate and we uh, were looking at what it would take to get a better life out of this. And in 1993, right after our daughter was born, the book came out, Your Money or Your Life. And a few years later, uh, The Millionaire Next Door came out. And those two books right there set the whole trend. And we took that savings rate. We ran with it. Uh, we actually reached financial independence in 1999 at the peak of the internet. Uh, we joke today that everybody reached financial independence in 1999 <laughs> for about 15 minutes. <laughs> right. Um, and I retired from active duty in 2002 and I did a 20 year career and I've been retired now for just under 20 years. So I've got the two bookends coming together there in a few months. That's great. Yeah. Uh, how did you find those books? Did, did somebody introduce you to those books or? Well, actually uh, your money, or your life was on the uh, new arrivals table at the library wow. uh, back in the 1990s. And so uh, once I had that one, uh, we knew that Millionaire Next Door was coming out because it was getting a lot of press at the time. This mm -hmm. was unusual. And uh, it wasn't until much later that we actually saw things that today are conventional wisdom, like uh, the 4% safe withdrawal rate right. or the Trinity study. Right. Did you have friends? Like what, what, what did your friends say when you told him you're pursuing this FI <laughs> term? Because nowadays it's like, it's not quite mainstream, but it's a little more popular. Why would I tell my friends? <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was uh, serving until the next obligation. You, you really didn't know if you wanted to stay longer than your next service obligation. And at the other time, everybody assumed that you were going to get a job after you got out of the military. Right. And nobody ever had said the words financial independence back then. I don't think the acronym FIRE even came along until the late 1990s, maybe 96 or 97. And back then, if you started talking to people about reaching financial independence and quitting your job, well, clearly you were not career material in the military and you weren't worthy <laughs> mm -hmm. of the next promotion or the next good duty station. And if you said that you were going to do that when you got out of the military, well, you, you were just crazy talk. You were deluded. Yeah. Uh, maybe you were burned out and uh, you were going to be chronically unemployed. Those, of course, all turned out to be untrue, but back then financial independence did not have any of the 
credibility or even the, the desire that people have today. Mm. Well, I mean, to be fair, though, you have been chronically unemployed for the last 20 years. I've had and... work at not working. Exactly right. And it's <laughs> it's been very successful. Yeah. <laughs> My father-in-law isn't very sure about this, but I've enjoyed every day of it. Back then, you had the genesis, the idea for the Military Guide to Financial independ Independence and Retirement. And that came out, I think, in 2011. Was that right? That's right, 2011. Yeah. Uh, it came out after another author had written a book called Work Less, Live More. And Bob Clyatt wrote that on a internet forum where we all helped him write the book. He crowdsourced it. And in 2005, the other military service members and veterans on, the, on, the, on that same forum said, well, we should write one for the military because we all have pensions and, and cheap health care. How come there aren't more financially independent military veterans? And so we started writing in 2005. I crowdsourced that. And finally, we had a manuscript by 2009. I sold that to a publisher in 2010, and it came out in 2011. Of course, today, your experience has been completely different and, and way better than what we did back then. Yeah, I mean, we've now with the self-publishing industry, it's complete, and the, exactly. the internet and Amazon, I mean, it's completely changed, Much better. changed the game. So what, so, I mean, you were on these, the web forums, but did it, why did it fall to you to write the book? Were you the most <laughs> prolific, uh, I mean, it wasn't even I, blogging back then. It was just, you know, posting on, on forums. And I, I enjoy writing. Uh, some people, perhaps my spouse, uh, feel that I just can't shut up. It's a good thing I have the entire internet to write for. But right. at the time, I was one of the, yeah, you're right. I was one of the more prolific posters on the forum. And also, we were all interested in talking about the issues. And I had had a lot of thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. And eventually, it's just one of those things where everybody in the room turns to you and says, Nords, what do you say? And at that time... To my spouse's credit, she also said, Nords, you have a book on you. You should write this. That's great. Yeah, have that support. Yep. So you you and your wife were dual military, mm -hmm. two incomes the entire time that you were saving. That's right. Did you live on both those incomes or did we, you? We never knew when one of us was leaving active duty. We, at that time in our lives, were living somewhat in fear, right? You never knew when you'd have to quit your active duty job and, and go do something else. And so we tried to save one income and live on the other income. We maintained a savings rate of at least 40% for almost the entire time that we were in uniform. Now, wow. sometimes it was higher, sometimes it was a little lower. It depended on what was happening that month or that year. But 40%, and today you can go look at a calculator for financial independence that tells you 40% savings rate, 17 years. Yeah. I've actually got a chart in my book. I think exactly. That's, you know, it's a chart that you can find almost anywhere on the internet, but I, not in 1994. <laughs> yeah. That's very true. Well, so Spencer, that actually brings me to a, a good point. You failed to mention one of Doug's best accolades in, in the introduction is that he's in pretty elite company as one of the beta readers of your book, of course, alongside <laughs> me and a couple other uh, people who are, who are great. So we appreciate the, the buy-in there and, and the feedback you gave. Uh, for Spencer's book. And then you had a new book with your daughter you co-authored in 2020. And that's where I want to shift, uh, ask a couple of questions about yeah. parenting and, and raising kids. So that book that came out is called Raising Your Money Savvy Family for Next Generation Financial Independence. Um, I have three kids. Um, what, what, what should you tell the listeners as kind of the main theme or the main highlights of the book if they haven't heard of it or read it yet? We, we talk about the tactics. You can read a lot on a book about how you should raise your kids. And we talk about what we did. And as near as we can tell from our research, this is the only book where we talk about what we parents tried with our daughter, our brilliant parenting tactics, <laughs> uh, maybe not so much, and her reaction at the time when we tried it on her, when she was a kid and we did something when she was five years old or eight years old or 13 years old, we talk about what we set up, what her reaction was to it at that age, and now what her reaction as, is to it as an adult raising her own daughter and trying to navigate that same challenge, a series of uh, challenges to get her daughter to also be financially literate. So it's quite interesting what the insights are to a kid. Uh, they, at a very early age, would like to learn how to manage money, just like a grown-up. Uh, however, first thing you need to teach a kid is how to physically manage their money, how to understand the counting and what the coins are worth and how it all adds up. And they're going to have to start making choices. And the way they make choices is they make a lot of bad choices. 
and as a parent, it's hard to stand back and let your kid run around in that sandbox of financial literacy and make choices without hurting themselves too badly. But you have to keep a mental picture of your kid lighting a $20 bill on fire and running around the backyard, waving it like a 4th of July sparkler. <laughs> That's called learning. And it's painful to watch. I think one of one of the, my favorite concepts in the book, which actually I think is maybe one of the most popular uh, concepts just, you know, from looking at, at some of your stuff online in preparation for the interview is the kids 401k. Oh yeah. So preparing basically in the example of preparing your kids for the first car and teaching them how to save and how to invest. Can you explain that to our listeners a little bit about how, how'd you come up with that concept and, and what is it? Well, at the time the, our daughter was born in 1992, the thrift savings plan for the military uh, came out in 2002, but there was this big ramp up for the whole idea that the military would have a 401k. So my spouse and I had been reading about it and learning about it and saving for financial independence. And our daughter was coming up on our eighth birthday. We always tried to have a milestone birthday, like a, a big boost in privileges or a little more allowance or something that would make this birthday memorable. And we were sitting around discussing it and she came up, my spouse came up with the idea of a 401k savings goal, because when you're eight years old and you're looking forward to your first car, that's an entire lifetime away. Yeah. That's the ultimate long-term goal. Imagine if you knew that you were going to retire and you were in your thirties and you were going to wait until your sixties to be able to touch your retirement accounts. So we riffed off of that and said, well, when our daughter is 16 years old, we're going to do the math behind the scenes and start the kid 401k. We talked about mandatory contributions and matching contributions. And of course, you can't borrow from your 401k in our family. And we set the whole thing up so that when she turned 16, she'd have $5,000. It's just like the Dr. Evil voice <laughs> to go out and buy a car. Now, the first thing that parents asked me is, okay, genius, uh, where are we getting this $5,000? And the answer is you're doing what you can do in your family. Maybe you have that money for your kid. Maybe you're always planning on buying your kid a car. Maybe you're not planning on buying your kid a car, but there's going to be some large amount of money that you're going to give to your teen at some point in their life before they leave the house. And that's where the money comes from, is money that you are going to spend on them anyway, except that now the money is going to be under their control. And this whole concept was you're saving for the day when you have a big chunk of money under your control and you have to be ready to handle it. We also found that knowing at age 16 that she would have her own ride and she'd be totally free to go wherever she wanted as long as she was home by curfew, that it took a lot of stress off her to figure out what car she was going to get or how it was going to be handled or what she was going to do. To her, it was more about hey, I'm going to turn 16 in a few years and let's talk about what cars are out there and what kind of car I want and how I'm going to do this. Yeah, that's really neat. Uh, the next topic I wanted to ask about was um, how you guys described in the book about chores, allowances, and compensation. So you guys chose to, to give an allowance and said that's kind of a family's choice. Um, chores were part of just being in the family. And yep. then your daughter could do extra jobs if she wanted to make um, extra money on top of that. Uh, can you just kind of explain that concept? And also, do you still rec you still like that model and recommend that? Well, our, our granddaughter is two years old, so she's going to find out about allowance here in another couple of years. But every family is different. And we're agnostic on the whole idea of what people do with allowances and chores and jobs. But we've set up a, a wide range of choices and families can mm -hmm. design for themselves. We feel that the whole idea with the allowance is to give your kid enough money that they can imagine doing anything without being able to do nothing. They have to make choices and they can't choose everything. They are limited in their choices by the size of their allowance. So you're just shoveling that allowance toward them. This is, again, money you probably would be spending on them anyway. You're shoveling that allowance of a couple dollars a week initially so that they can learn to make those choices. And of course, immediately the allowance is going to vaporize because they're going to make a whole <laughs> lot of bad choices. That's just as a parent, that's painful to yes. watch, but it's yeah. part of the learning process because now you have a teachable moment. You can sit there and talk with them. How did it feel when you spent all your allowance for that toy that broke the week after you bought it home? How, <laughs> yeah. how did you feel when you saw the commercial and then played with the toy and found out it wasn't all that? 
how did you feel when you were jealous of that toy your friends had and you got one too, but now nobody plays with it anymore? Those are all mm -hmm. very big emotional circumstances, occurrences in a kid's life. And they're very valuable, not, not for judging, but just for saying, how did you feel? What would you do differently next time? And how can we make this work out better? Uh, uh, you And you started the intentional conversations in teaching your daughter about money um, when she stopped putting them in her mouth, right? <laughs> so, right, right. <laughs> and, then it, and then it's, you know, at first it's like, hey, stack them by color, stack them by size. And I just love the intentionality of, of having to invest in the kid's knowledge. And, um, you know, my son, we, we've done some allowance and some chore money and some things like that over the years my oldest one's 10 now. And, you know, he did the times where he bought the candy bar at the checkout line at target or whatever, and immediately regrets it. And I yep. knew he would, oh, yeah. but you gotta, you gotta let him experiment with that. So that's, that's awesome. Really neat concept. Well, the, the, the whole, the whole idea behind the allowance, by the way, is you get the allowance just because you're a member of the family. There's, there's no requirements for behavior or chores or anything else. You know, we used to talk about you get an allowance because you're a good member of the family and we never had to define that. Now, other families may make that contingent, but the whole idea, again, is to give the kid a reliable stream of income that they can trust. Imagine if your employer withheld your paycheck because you forgot to clean your room. And so we tried to treat her like an adult employee from that perspective. Uh, chores, again, you do chores to keep the house nice and clean and neat. And if you want to earn the additional revenue that comes from jobs, well, you have to do your chores. And that turned out to be one of the most powerful motivators known to mankind is that if you want more money, First, you have to do your chores. Yeah, today we would call that universal basic income. <laughs> UBI. Exactly. You can be a, you <laughs> yeah. can you can be lazy on universal basic That's income right. as long as you don't need any more income. Exactly. But as a kid yeah. making bad choices, man, you need a lot of income. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Doug, talking about college savings, one of the questions we get a lot whenever we talk about college savings or five twenty nine um, plans is, how do you know what the right amount is for my family? How did you guys work through that at, for your, for yourself? Well, I'll, I'll I'll tell you that we had the financial resiliency at the time with our high savings rate. One of the things we chose deliberately to plan for was to send her to the average cost of what a private college was going to be when she graduated from high school in 2010. And we invested aggressively, right? You start out with a lot of equities and then you gradually slide into bond funds and certificates of deposit as they get to be high school students. But that worked very well. We had the whole thing dialed in perfectly for the average private university four-year tuition. And then she got a scholarship. <laughs> so is that your worst nightmare? Or what? Well, actually, what she did is she signed up for the Navy ROTC program. That was the scholarship. Yeah. We've joked about signing over your firstborn to the military and in our family. It yeah. happened. So that's, again, for parents, that's a big debate. And it's even worse, I think, today than it was 15 years ago, because today the debate is, will they want to go to college? Will they want to go to a trade school? Will they want to just go to YouTube University or get a Google certificate? I, I don't know. I think, though, that the 529 is a great way to put a plan together, and it gives you the flexibility to change the beneficiary. It gives you the flexibility to withdraw the money. You pay the taxes, and you might pay a 10% penalty. However, you've also built up enough money in there that you can just change the beneficiary to a sibling, a nibbling, maybe even the next generation. Yeah. I don't know what the right answer is for how much money you want to save, but as a parent, you're going to set a goal. Your first, your first priority is your retirement, right? Nobody will loan mm -hmm. you money for retirement. You can get plenty of student loans for college. Mm. But once you've set that priority up, then you're going to do the best you can for the way you feel that your kid should be getting financially supported for college, whether that's Harvard or whether that's UH West Oahu. Uh, there's a big price difference between those two. <laughs> and and they're, they're going to figure out how to have some skin in the game on their own. You want them to be internally motivated. So if you do save a large college fund and your child gets a scholarship because of their merit or some other talent, then maybe you're willing to share some of that money with them. Maybe there's going to be profit sharing. Hmm. Yeah, another good concept. Um, the last kind of takeaway I have from this book series of questions is the concept of all hail 20 minutes a day. <laughs> and what I loved about that one is that it's not just for kids. Like I, I can implement this too, uh, for my own personal development, whether it's, you know, exercise or, or my budgeting. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how, how, uh, people can apply that to their lives and their, the development of their kids' financial habits? 
This, this is an old story in our family. By now, your listeners are probably beginning to notice that I married up. And <laughs> when my spouse was, We all did, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. When my spouse and I were at the Naval Academy, there was one evening where she was planning to study for a big test. And her roommate, who was supposed to go on duty at some job that we had back then as midshipmen, forgot. And her roommate didn't show up. And so the squad leader came by the room and said, hey, your roommate didn't show up. We need somebody to man this duty. You're it. Go do it. And there she was. Her entire evening was shot. She couldn't study for that exam the next day. So at the hard way, we learned that when you have a goal out there that you have to work on it for 20 minutes a day. Mm. And our daughter has heard that story many times over the years. <laughs> and she used that at college because she was also an ROTC and the same thing essentially happened to her. But it also takes those gigantic, audacious projects and breaks them down into tiny little steps. It doesn't really matter what you do 20 minutes a day, as long as you set aside 20 minutes a day and start thinking, I'm only here for 20 minutes. I'm going to do something in that time. Now, frequently, your 20-minute effort turns into 45 minutes, an hour, maybe an hour and a half. I use 20 minutes a day to work on the next writing project. Maybe it's answering a reader question or writing a blog post or working on a book chapter. But... 20 minutes a day, once it becomes an ingrained habit, maybe you do it the same time every day, maybe you do it in the same situation every day. Once you start that habit, it becomes automatic and you actually you actually miss it if mm -hmm. you don't do it. Yeah. And that's the best thing. Now, today we have a new bestseller book about atomic habits and everybody is is <laughs> all over this. And well, years ago it was called 20 minutes a day. And that's why you're the OG. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Doug, one of the uh, concepts you, you write about on your website and in the uh, your book, uh, The Military Guide, is the fog of work. Ah. And that, to me, is now that I'm actually nearing my own separation from the military, <laughs> and I'm going to, it's, uh, I'm actually kind of, a little bit, little part of me is dreading uh, losing the fog of work. But what is the fog of work and where did that concept come from and, and how, how can military service members kind of you know, take a moment to rise above it and, and see what's on the horizon. I'll, I'll point out that The Fog of Work comes from a book by a, an 18th century tactician, von Clausewitz, for those of you who have been to the right schools. But he says that once you start fighting the war, that the battlefield fills with smoke and you can't see what's going on. It's just like you're working at night or when you're in an area where you can't see the whole picture in front of you. And so The Fog of War to me, became a great metaphor for the fog of work, where you're at work and you're too busy to plan long-term goals like your quality of life, let alone your financial independence, your retirement date, and what you're going to do after you don't have to show up for the work anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about all the issues that go into that. This, this post got written on that same forum back in 2009, and it just gravitated naturally into the book. The whole idea is that you have to break free of the fog of work at some point and do some planning. It's hard. It's not easy. There's, there's always going to be a higher priority in your life than planning for your life. But you have to figure out how to break through the chronic fatigue, how to break through the daily stress, pull your nose away from the grindstone for a little bit. In the military, the closest I can think of to let you get the time to do that is your legendary 30 days of leave between duty stations. I don't know about you. I never had 30 days, but <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the rule, right? Yeah. Anyway, somewhere in there, you take some naps, you recover from chronic fatigue. After the first week, you're ready to start thinking and talking with your spouse or your significant other or your family about next steps. And eventually, you'll have an epiphany about what you want to do with your life or what the next step you want to do after this next obligation, whatever it may be. But you're actually able to break free of that daily routine. Mm -hmm. And for financial independence, it's as simple as having the time to break free of the fog or work to lay out your thrift savings plan, uh, percentage contribution, figure out where that money's going, find the money for your IRA, and figure out how high your savings rate can be. Those right. are all small things that we need to do that are very hard to get started. But uh, if you spend a certain amount of time every day on it, like, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes a day, perhaps, eventually that turns <laughs> into a habit and you're regularly tracking your expenses. You're automatically boosting your contributions to your IRA and your thrift savings plan, and you're saving even more for a goal of financial independence. You've put it in autopilot. 
Yeah. I talk about a lot about autopilot in my book as well. And oh, I think that's uh, essential, right? Yeah. It's, it's just, it just makes everything so much easier, right? Because decision, decision fatigue exactly. is a real thing. And if you can mm-hmm. make the choice, Tim Ferriss talks about making a choice that eliminates a hundred choices, any choice. So if you set up your, like Vanguard has a feature where you can say, max out my Roth IRA by the end of the year, you know, pull money out of my checking account. Oh, I love it. And every two weeks it, they go in there and I think it's like, $416 or whatever it is right now, but they go in there and they mm-hmm. pull money out uh, every two weeks or every month. And you can set the, you know, the asset allocation, 50% international, 50% U S whatever you want. And it just does it automatically. And you only have to set it up once and it will actually keep rolling over year to year if you forget about it. So, and, and people do. And they do. Right. Yeah. I mean, there was that, uh, I think it's apocryphal. I don't think it actually existed, but it was the Schwab. I think it was a Schwab study or Fidelity study where Fidelity. the the best performing accounts were when the owners had died because they, they it, just didn't mess with the uh, it, their it, investments. It sounds apocryphal, but I've read that. Story. Oh, you've read? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's realistic. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so speaking of you know the fog of work and um, investing for financial independence as your when you're in the military, what were some of the investing mistakes that you made early on in your journey <laughs> to FI? And how would you advise, you know, a, a service member today? Because there's a lot, there's a lot more options. I mean, you got robo, oh, yeah. robo advisors. You've got, I mean, Vanguard was just kind of recently started in the '70s. Is that right? Yeah. Um, 1976. Yeah. So the first Vanguard index fund was publicly sold. So mm-hmm. yeah, back then, of course, in the 1980s, Vanguard was crazy. Nobody mm-hmm. was going to touch Vanguard because those guys had no plan. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they had a whole bunch of rules. You couldn't trade. You couldn't move your money around whenever you felt you needed. No, no, yeah. not Vanguard. No. But the point is that today we do have more choices. And you talk about decision fatigue, right? You're just overwhelmed with options. And the biggest uh, biggest issue is getting through analysis paralysis right. to make a choice. So we made many mistakes. And I would say that the most important aspect of all those mistakes is that a high savings rate for financial independence will overcome a lot of stupid mistakes Mm -hmm. during the 15 or 20 years that you're trying to reach financial independence. You don't have to beat yourself up for spilling your latte on your desk and and go without it. You can go buy another one if that's what you want to do (laughs) without beating yourself up over making a mistake like that. So back in the 1980s, you traded frequently because you never knew when the stock market was going to go down and you had to get out before it went down and get back in before it went up. You actually paid sales charges. When you were buying a mutual fund, it was normal to pay 2% sales charges. You paid high fees. You paid high annual fees. And by high, I mean a really high annual fee was 2.5%. A normal fee was considered to be 1% to 1.5%. 150 basis points to have an annual fee in a mutual fund. That was normal back then. It's not so expensive today. Right. And so all those things were available if you went to Vanguard, but it just wasn't something that was done back then because Vanguard had too many rules and too many restrictions. And we all knew we needed to chase hot managers and pick the next big fund and keep moving our money around. And all those uh, investing mistakes, taking action felt good, but all those things turned out to be long-term mistakes. And yet, and yet somehow we still reached financial independence. So once you set yourself up for a high savings rate, just just by cutting out the waste. Hmm. It isn't putting yourself on a financial diet. It's looking at where your money goes, figuring out what you really value and cutting out the waste on the things that you don't care about. That raises your savings rate. That gets you to financial independence faster and you can still make mistakes and still reach it. Yeah, love that. So Black Friday, just- Wow. You invest- you, way you, back now. You investing in the 80s, maybe think about we this. We were there. Um, did you- did you make any moves around that time? Did you did you time it right? Did you miss it? Did you was it just a black swan event that here's nobody... here's what really goes on in your mind for Black Friday? We had no idea. Yeah. And on Saturday we read by accident in the newspaper <laughs> that something had happened to the stock market on Friday. But if you really haven't been paying attention to the stock market, if you're newly married and you just started graduate school and you're busy with other activities, the stock market doesn't have a lot of relevance to your daily life. Yeah. On Monday, we went back to school and the Monterey Navy postgraduate school campus was deserted. There's nobody there. Hmm. And we needed another day or two to figure it out, but it turned out that most of our classmates were at home dialing on their 1-800 phone lines (laughs) to their brokers at their investing firms 
trying to buy into the market because they were sure the market was going to go back up. Um, now, some of them were still trying to sell yeah. on Monday and Tuesday, but some of them were trying to buy. And I remember having a conversation with Marge at that point. I think it happened uh, near a payday. A payday came up a week or two later. And we said, gosh, it looks like this would be a good time to invest. So we threw another 200 or $300 in the stock market. That's how we handled Black Friday. In other words, we really didn't understand. We didn't appreciate. And we didn't really do much different. We had been sending money every paycheck. Back then, you wrote out a check and put an envelope, put a stamp on it. And we'd been doing that regularly since we'd married. So we just added a little bit more money to it, having absolutely no idea what we were doing, but knowing that the market was probably going to be higher later. Uh, and we kept on doing that. Every time that there was a recession or a bad forecast in the market or any time volatility reared its ugly head, we were dollar cost averaging every paycheck. Yeah. And we just kept doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. Your asset allocation while you were saving for FI. What was it and has it changed since you've become FI? And how do you factor a military pension into that? And, and th those are excellent questions, right? Because you get a lot of those questions, mm -hmm. I, I imagine. I know I do. When we were both on active duty, uh, our uh, reliability of employment was fairly high. You're not going to get laid off. And so you're probably not going to need a big emergency fund. Mm -hmm. And we also knew mm -hmm. that we were going to be in the Navy until we had two or three years of our obligation ahead of us. And we had plenty of time to plan our exit if it came to that. We invested 100% equities for most of our careers. Every time we came to a decision point where we talked about backing off and getting more conservative, uh, we said, well, we're making more money. We have a job. We're getting paid well. Our savings rate is 40%. Let's just keep investing in the stock market and let it go up. Now, admittedly, this was the greatest bull market of all time from 1982 to the end of 1999. Mm -hmm. And so it was easy to make those decisions, kind of like the last 10 years yeah, have been, exactly. right? until yeah. March of 2020. Right. <laughs> so you talk yourself into that based on your recency bias. If the market's been going up and that's all you ever know why you're investing, well, by golly, you're going to have a high equity portfolio. Mm -hmm. And we kept doing that. However, we eventually, as we approached retirement, began that discussion of should we back off? Should we add more bonds? And we realized that a military pension or VA disability compensation, if you don't stick around for retirement, those two streams of income are adjusted every year for inflation. Mm -hmm. And it's just like having the income from a portfolio of bonds, I bonds or tips. Yep. It's rising every year with inflation. And one day you're also going to get social security, which is again, just like I bonds rises every year for inflation. And when we looked at that and realized how much bond income we had from pensions mm -hmm. and from VA disability income, we said, well, we're just going to keep investing <laughs> in a high equity portfolio. Yeah. And we did. Now, at, at the time we retired and while we were on active duty, we were investing in blended mutual funds that had different types of equities, big, medium, small. We'd invest in uh, different exchange traded funds that had different sectors, you know, dividend mm -hmm. stocks and small cap value stocks and maybe Berkshire Hathaway, B shares, kinds of, those kinds of things. Yep. But it was all equities. In 2017, uh, we realized that as the years had gone by, we'd been reducing our expense ratios more and more and more. We'd gone from one and a half percent down to four tenths of a percent, down to a quarter of a percent. And in 2017, we said, let's simplify our lives. Mm -hmm. Let's stick with this 100% equity application, uh, equity asset allocation. Mm -hmm. And we went for uh, the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Exchange Traded Fund. It's got 0.03% yep. expense ratio. I've never ever expected it to get this low, <laughs> but it simplified our investments. Mm -hmm. And so we have stayed greater than 90% equities. In fact, if I looked up my personal capital account today, it would probably say something like 98% because I have enough money in cash to pay the credit card bill due at the end of the month. Right. Right. The military TSP, the thrift savings plan, that didn't come about in the military, I think until 2000, 2001. Legislation was passed in 2000 yep. and implemented in January of 2002. Okay. So didn't mean for this podcast to be a history lesson, but... Uh, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> you, saw, you saw the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Right. <laughs> uh, so you never had access to the military TSP. So, Until then. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. For, and that was the last... I year. had five months of contributions. Five months. Yeah. And you actually did contribute? Five whole months. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. As, soon yeah. as, I, as soon as I retired... Yep. They kicked me out because <laughs> right. I hadn't contributed enough. Right. 
Uh, but if you had had access, it would have been definitely something that you would have contributed to. Oh, yeah. Is that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, probably, again, just 100% equities asset allocation. If On equity duty, I would have contributed, you know, CS and I funds. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it, it's everybody's asset allocation is a highly individual choice. Definitely. We had convinced ourselves that we could handle the volatility. And that turned out to be true with, mm-hmm. with time and practice. Uh, I would say if you have no idea what you're doing, you just pick one of the long dated life cycle funds. Yeah. Uh, if you have some idea or if somebody has mentored you and talked about how to handle volatility, then you can choose the CES and I funds, however you want to mix them up. Right. There's blog posts out there that talk about. Probably um, on your website. A range, well, <laughs> among others, but yeah. there's a range of asset allocations and they're all good enough. Good enough. That's you right. You don't have to have the perfect asset allocation. You just have to pick one and get moving and automate it, right? Put it, put it in auto cycle. Yeah. So, Doug, let's talk a little bit about the 4% rule and flexible retirement sp- spending now that you're 20 years into retirement. How has that gone for you with safe withdrawal rate calculations and, and your expenses going up and down in retirement? Um, do, how do you guys ensure that you have enough money and you don't run out of it? Because I think that's a worry for people on this side, the, the side that Spencer and I are on of, of financial independence. You how have. you you've done it for 20 years what's what are the lessons and how's it going we, we can tell now it's all going to work out just fine <clears throat> we've gone from when we retired when i retired from active duty we've gone from having enough money to uh 10 years down the road after the great recession ended and the stock market started to come back we realized we had enough money and then a few years later we realized we had more than enough money and today we have way more money than we need to the point where we know we're not spending it fast enough. Now I'm, I sound like I'm joking about that, but I'm also reflecting back on 20 years of uncertainty and volatility. And there's a lot of fear in there. There's a lot of scarcity mentality in there, Mm -hmm. but we started with a 4% safe withdrawal rate because that's pretty much all that was out there. And when I say 4% safe withdrawal rate, what I mean is we had expenses, and some of those expenses were paid for by my pension, but all the rest of those expenses were handled by the 4% safe withdrawal rate. We had enough money saved up for financial independence if we had the pension and we were spending at the 4% safe withdrawal rate mm-hmm. from our investments. Mm-hmm. So we've been doing that for 20 years. Now, in the first decade, everybody is concerned, worried, white knuckles on the wheel. And part of that is because the risk of a bad sequence of returns. Right. You worry about sequence of returns risk. We handled that risk for the first 10 years by keeping two years of our expenses in cash. And the idea was if the stock market dropped like crazy, that we would just keep spending from our two years of cash, 4% per year, whatever expenses were. And if the stock market went up that year, we would replenish that cash stash to have that two years of expenses ready to go for the next year. Now, we got a little test in that in 2002, the internet recession. Mm-hmm. Uh, we retired right into the worst part of that. And we ran through some of that cash dash right away. And it looked like my financial independence experience was going to be miserable, brief, and back to work. <laughs> but by 2004, it was working out fine. We kept that two years cash dash going and uh, ran right into 2008. Uh, by the end of 2009, we had spent that two years cash, cash stash and we were starting to sell some shares out of our our exchange traded funds that we invested in back then, some actually selling some equities. Uh, interestingly, we had been invested in those long enough that those shares still had plenty of capital gains. They had lost a lot of value in the Great Recession, but they still had capital gains. We weren't selling any losers in 2009 or 2010. Mm. After that first decade, around 2012, we realized that we were still following the 4% safe withdrawal rate, but the balance in our checking account was starting to go up. And I went back and started looking at it. And if we had reset, if we had started all over again in 2012 and looked at our expenses versus our withdrawal rate, our withdrawal rate had dropped from 4% per year, the safe withdrawal rate. It had dropped to about three and a half percent. And today we know from a bunch of different studies that if 4% safe withdrawal rate works for 30 years with a very high probability of success, three and a half percent will work for the rest of your life, yeah. at least 50 years, 60 years, maybe even 75 years. I, I aim to find out. We'll, we'll check back here <laughs> yeah. in a couple of decades. <laughs> Let's do it again in 100. That's right. And and so we knew that we had survived sequence of returns risk and could continue spending at the 4% safe withdrawal rate without feeling that scarcity mentality or worrying about running out of money. 
And by not worrying about running out of money, I mean things like spending more money on travel, mm -hmm. spending more money on gifting our family, and spending more money on philanthropy. That's, That's what I mean by we're not spending it fast enough. We're starting to ramp up those things. We've managed to make another difficult shift from a scarcity mentality to one of abundance. Mm -hmm. And this is at least as hard as the fog of war. It mm -hmm. takes a few years, but eventually you realize that you have enough money, you have financial security, you're going to be okay, and you feel comfortable spending. So a lot of the habits that served you well when you're saving for financial independence, once you've reached FI and you get through kind of the 10 year sequence of return risk and you realize, oh, we're going to be fine. You have to unlearn some of those habits. And the frugality that gets you to financial independence doesn't necessarily serve you well in financial independence, but maybe it does. Maybe you still feel more secure because right. you know you're not going to run out of money. You know you can play good defense. You know yeah. that although you're following the 4% safe withdrawal rate, you also know that the studies behind that, they never talked about variable spending. They mm -hmm. never talked about right. someday getting social security. Mm -hmm. They uh, had other assumptions in there that you, you're you not a 4% safe withdrawal rate robot. You're going to make human changes and you're going to maybe even get a job. Yeah, but that's right. If you, you can have go to, back to work. Yeah. Ironically, if you do need to get a job, it turns out those kind of jobs where you only need five or $10,000 worth of income every year Pretty during easy. a recession, yeah. they're everywhere. Yeah. And nobody wants them because they don't come with health insurance. That's right. So you can work your way through that literally if you have to. And that ends up making you feel more comfortable and more secure. Uh, and in today in our family, I mean, you're looking around this house, but today in our family, we're still frugal. We mm. still have habits. For example, I like to compost just to make sure that we're taking some of our household trash and putting it back into the yard as fertilizer. Yeah. And that's just a challenge. We enjoy doing it. Right. So, yeah. And you have the freedom and the flexibility to do that. Because, and the time. That's and right. the time because of FI. Uh, so we talked about Black Friday there, but okay. taking it back to uh, the COVID crash of March uh, 2020, what was that like watching your, I'm sure, I, I'm assuming your portfolio was probably decimated to the degree of maybe 20, 25, 30% down, depending on your, your equity split. But was that just a woo saw, just turn off the news and, and wait and wait it out? And I mean, if, if you didn't do anything, which I'm assuming you didn't, uh, it came roaring back in, in a big way. And so we look brilliant now. <laughs> exactly. But, 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 but going through it at the time, that's the problem. Is yes. If you knew what was going to happen in the next recession, you'd get out the day before, you'd get back in the day before things start going up, mm -hmm. and you'd be totally rational and logical the entire time. Yeah. And that's the whole problem is you never see that recession coming. For you to see that recession coming, there'd have to be a global pandemic mm -hmm. that paralyzed the economic structure of the entire United States. Yeah. And it sounds funny now, now that we see that we are finally getting out to the end of the tunnel on that. But at the time, it was more gloom and doom. It was scary. Very scary stuff. So when we went through the Great Recession, we had looked at our, our net worth going up and up and up during 2006, 2007. And I remember one day opening a financial statement in 2007 and thinking, this is nuts. Yeah. It, just, it was monopoly money that high up. It would, <laughs> right. yeah. we, had, we had had stocks that I had made a mistake picking and they still went up. Right. <laughs> and we were selling a lot of individual stocks. In retrospect, I made a lot of mistakes back then. And so when the markets crashed in 2008 and 2009, we went from a ridiculously high peak down 56%. So when 2020 rolled around, March of 2020, and the stock market started to go down, we realized this was a problem, but we knew we could handle 56%. We had enough. We weren't really looking at it back then because when the market was going down at the end of March, my spouse and I were visiting our family mm. in California. Yeah. Our, our granddaughter had been born just a couple of months before that. And while we were visiting, we started noticing that a whole bunch of people were complaining about what became the pandemic. And we didn't even know if we could get back home. We were afraid we were going to be locked into quarantine in California and not able to get a flight back to Hawaii. So we were totally focused on getting out of California, getting back home to Hawaii, and then quarantining here in the house for a couple of weeks. Looking at the stock market just didn't seem to be a priority right. at all. We had, but we also had the confidence that comes from 30 years, 40 years of investing yep. and knowing that we could survive the Great Recession. How bad could a pandemic be after the Great Recession? That kind of attitude now, in retrospect, could have been a lot worse. It could have been. Uh, mm -hmm. The point was we had an asset allocation and we had the confidence in that asset allocation that comes from all those years of 
finding our comfort zone and our experience. And so when this happens, it's, it's not fun. You're unhappy, you're worried, all these things are going on. But on the other hand, you're in relatively good health. You have food, you have power, you have money if you need it. And so we knew we could get through this. Mm -hmm. And that's the attitude we took this. We didn't change a single thing. Uh, we didn't even invest more money in the market. We just wrote it out and didn't change any of that. Uh, my son-in-law and my daughter uh, put some of that dry powder to work. Mm -hmm. We had gifted our granddaughter money for her 529 account. Now, this was totally coincidence, but she was born in January. It took a little time to get the birth certificate. Hmm. It took a little time to get the social security number. It took a little time to start up the 529. There might've been some sleep deprivation in there for the parents, <laughs> yeah. but they made their first investment in that 529 with our gift to them in late March of 2020. Wow. Crossed their fingers and hoped they'd still have some money left. Yeah. And it turned out by the end of 2020, of course, the best investor in our house couldn't change your own diapers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, during those troubling times, do you do you have a written plan that you refer back to, or is it just kind of all in your head or all in the spreadsheet? We, we, by now, don't have to go back and refer to that plan. We do have that plan. Mm -hmm. And the reason we have that plan is estate planning uh, mm -hmm. for our disability. If someday I find out that I no longer have my cognition and can't take care of my investments, my daughter and, and my son-in-law know where the folder is in our desk in the next room to go look in there to figure out what in the world was he doing with his money and how should we handle it from here. Yeah. So we do have that plan. Now, we don't have an investor policy statement that uh, you'll find on Vanguard or the Vogelheads. Uh, uh, today, if I was starting, I would write that investment mm. policy statement because it forces you to think about asset allocation. Mm. So one of the excuses people talk about when when they're, they hear about financial independence as an option is high cost of living areas, sometimes kids. So you've experienced both of those living in Hawaii and having a child. Um, what, what do you say to, to the doubters of, of financial independence for high cost of living areas and things like that? What was your experience like um, being a large portion of, of child raising in Hawaii? We, we had that high savings rate because we were managing our cost of living. For example, everybody talks about the high cost of living in Hawaii. And the only way to counteract the high cost of buying a home in Hawaii is to go out and buy a crappy home <laughs> and spend a lot of time and effort on sweat equity. And then most of us <laughs> do it yourself. Spencer's looking around as he's sitting here and saying, yeah, it's doing all right now. Yeah, he, he wasn't yeah. here 20 years ago, but it looks pretty good now. <laughs> And you'll make those choices throughout your life. You'll decide what's important to you, whether you want to actually work the extra years to afford a really big house in a high cost of living area, or if you would prefer to reach financial independence on a low cost of living and move to somewhere where life costs less. Maybe that's somewhere else in America. Maybe you're going to be a digital nomad. Uh, maybe you don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to try those lifestyles two or three years at a time and switch around until you figure out what your ideal lifestyle is. But I would say that any choice you make in financial independence is going to involve a trade-off between your goal of your lifestyle and how many more years you want to work to afford that lifestyle. So speaking about real estate, on your site, you argue that, you sh I think it's kind of facetious, but you shouldn't buy a home while you're on active duty uh, or even when you retire. Can you elaborate on why you advise military service members to not I, purchase homes? I, I blog in a snarky voice. That is correct. <laughs> However, uh, when I talk about facetious, don't buy a house on active duty, it's because I get the emails from people who have destroyed their finances from buying a house on active duty. Yeah. Now, admittedly, uh, many of these decisions are made for the right reasons at the time, but they end up leveraging themselves in tremendous amounts of debt, frequently with the VA loan that the helpful mortgage broker and the very helpful real estate agent have put them under without them understanding the consequences of what happens after you get transferred before the home is appreciated to make uh, the value that you need to be able to sell it. Um, but the whole point of not buying a house while you're on active duty is to not put yourself in that position. So I go to great effort to list all of those things that are going to bite you later on when you try to sell the house in order that you know what's coming and avoid it. Maybe it makes more sense, especially in a high cost area like Hawaii, to not buy a house, to live in base housing or to rent, knowing that you're going to barely have enough money to afford what you want to do here. But in another duty station, you're going to do better. Or while you're here, if you are going to buy a house, then maybe you're going to bring in roommates, maybe you're going to house hack, 
maybe you're going to do a live in rehab. You're going to buy what we did a crappy place and work on it for a couple of years while you're here on, on duty to be able to have the equity to pay for the closing costs when you sell. I'm not saying you're going to make money. I'm saying that you're probably going to be able to afford selling the place when you finally get to that point. Or maybe you're a real estate entrepreneur. And if you've read that post, you've looked at it and said, yeah, but they're not buying an investment rental property. They're just buying a nice place to live. And you'd be absolutely right. Yep. Now, if you can go to a duty station with a mindset of looking for an investment rental property and buying that as your home and setting yourself up for success when you leave, that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Doug, uh, you're a prolific redditor. I see you uh, on your uh, your Nords account on oh, yeah. r slash military finance. Uh, you're also a bit of a legend on some other uh, more ancient forums out there. <laughs> but uh, what sites or resources do you check today or what do you recommend to you know the uh, the, the airman or sailor or soldier or Marine out there who's, who's gung ho about FI and, and really wants to get into it. Where, where can, where do you point those people? Reddit, Reddit has been great. As you know, the military forums on Reddit, the military financial forums on Reddit, they're great. Uh, I spend a lot of time in Facebook groups. Uh, you're familiar with choose FI, U S military, uh, other groups on Reddit, actually on Facebook that have the keyword military in them that yeah. are dealing with finances. Uh, I also still spend time on earlyretirement.org. That's one of the forums that I was one of the first 25 members of <laughs> almost 20 years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, you're familiar with the Mr. Money Mustache forums, a lot of military mm -hmm. families there. I spend time on Bogleheads. I check in there once in a while just to see what the conversations are. Mm -hmm. And it depends what the demographics of the group are. Mm -hmm. So on Mr. Money Mustache or Reddit, you tend to see a lot of younger people in their careers just starting out, just recovering from something, moving up to building their net worth. Whereas on Bogleheads, you're probably finding people discussing how they're going to withdraw their G fund from the thrift savings plan now right. that they're in their 70s. Yeah. So it's this whole spectrum and you can either work on the problem you're facing now or look ahead to things that you might be concerned about down the road. I spend, I think, the majority of my time on Facebook and some on Twitter just because those are the easiest things for me to do. Mm. That's great. What are you working on now? Well, I'm writing. I'm just not writing the right stuff, right? 20 minutes a day, you'd think I'd get this stuff done faster. <laughs> uh, but the military guide, that, that first edition of the book is mm -hmm. uh, 10 years old now, and it's time to put out an updated edition. So I'm talking with the traditional publisher over revisions to the book. For example, the blended retirement system. Mm -hmm. But there's a number of revisions to be made to the book for things that have changed in the last 10 years. And that, that book itself will definitely be an ebook it'll be print on demand this time instead mm -hmm. of a stack of paperbacks in a warehouse. And I'm also going to add an audiobook edition Great. and I'm going to record that. Uh, if you ever want to humble yourself, as you know, mm -hmm. go record an audio book and yeah. find out that your writing sounds great in your head until it gets through the microphone. <laughs> Welcome to my podcast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but that audio book is very valuable to making it sure is. you have a good ebook, a good uh, print on demand. And that, that's probably going to take me another year to, uh, come out with a new edition mm -hmm. of the military guide. And there's a whole bunch of discussion in the back about whether you change the ISBN or how you do this on Amazon, all the other things that go into changing the book. Yep. Uh, I'm working on a third book. Uh, right now I'm in that research phase where it's difficult to tell that I'm getting anything done, but I'm reading a lot and having a lot of discussions about it. The third book is going to be about life after financial independence. Oh, great. It's uh, tentatively going to be titled Living Your Financial Independence. Mm -hmm. And the whole point is that 10 years, 20 years, 30 years after financial independence, here's what we've seen. Here's mm -hmm. what we've screwed up. Here's what has worked really well, yeah. despite volatility, despite global pandemics and other disasters, and what we think we're going to be doing for the next 20, 30 years. That's awesome. I'm setting myself up for having to keep that book up to date. Too. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I've written two. I'm going to need another five years probably before that third book comes out, yeah. but I will, I, I, at one point, I did feel like I was aging out, mm. all right? And the topics change. And what was really important in the 1990s and early 2000s, nobody cares about anymore. It's all fairly conventional wisdom. It's fairly straightforward. However, uh, one of another author, another financial author I respect, Paul Merriman, he just published a, a new book at age 77. So wow. you know, I, I got at least another decade and a half. To yeah, it. that's true. I mean, your perspective, especially, I'll speak for the military audience, but you know, you achieving FI even before you're in the military pension and then living a financial independence life after 
you know, retiring from the military, uh -huh. that, that perspective, and then turning around and telling the rest of us who are working our way towards FI uh, and telling us, hey, it works and you can do it. The That's, water's great. Come right? on in. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's hard. It's very hard when you're leaving that uniform service to have the faith, to have the knowledge, to have the understanding of 4% safe withdrawal rate. And if you're doing this with your family, it's hard to explain to your family, hey, it's going to be great. Well, this will work out fine. Yet it has. Yeah. And I've got to communicate that. Yeah. What What about for someone who is a little maybe closer to retirement, they're later in their career, and they, they didn't hear about financial independence when they were 18 or 20. What advice would you give someone who's maybe five years from retirement and, and they didn't quite get the start that we would have hoped that they would have gotten? Well, it's that, it's that old joke about planting a tree, right? The best time to plant that tree was 20 years ago, but yeah. the second best time to plant that tree is today. Yeah. And you start where you are with what you got. Uh, there's a Facebook group called Finally FI, Finally Financially Independent. And it's mostly people who have started pursuing financial independence in their late 40s and early 50s. Wow. Uh, sometimes it's been because they've been living paycheck to paycheck for years. Other times it's student debt. Once in a while, it's divorce or a family disaster, like a medical crisis or even a death. Uh, however, you start with where you are and you start the way we all start by tracking your expenses and cutting out the waste. And your savings rate is what determines the speed at which you reach financial independence. The lower your expenses, the higher your savings rate, the faster you get to financial independence. So you might still be working until your 60s, but you'll have much more security when you get there. And there's always social security in your 60s if you've got the working credit in the United States. But the whole point is that you do the best you can with what you know and move forward from there. Jamie, anything to uh, wrap up with? Uh, no, Doug, I really appreciate having you on today. Like we said before, seeing someone on the other side of financial independence <laughs> and someone that, you know, I... You, I don't know if you remember, um, Spencer brought you into the squadron one day at work and I was, you know, busy pounding away on the keyboard and like, oh, hey, you know, I'm, I'm busy saving the world or whatever. Probably not, actually. But, um, you know, having seen your your blog posts and your books and um, and and all the goodness you put out on Facebook, you know, I'm in a couple of the same Facebook groups as you. Um, and it's just it's really neat to be able to see that firsthand and, and to learn from you. So we, we're so grateful for you coming and Thank taking you. the time to be with us today. I'm paying it forward. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Uh, Doug, before we wrap up here, is there anywhere you want to point people, uh, website, Twitter, Facebook, anywhere they you want people to go to find you? It's, uh, or do you want to stay no, no, it's, <laughs> un it's, unfindable? It's, it's easy. It's, uh, after all this time, I've got a pretty good search engine ranking. Uh, just look for the military guide. Just searching for those three words. We're in the first page of results. Uh, also look for Doug Nordman uh, on Twitter. My handle on Twitter is the military guide and, and I'm all over Facebook as Doug Nordman. I uh, make my entire Facebook profile public so that people can stock. I mean, so that people can look and <laughs> see what's going on and see that to put as many posts up on Facebook as I do, uh, I can't be lying about financial independence. Mm. It's the, the lifestyle and I show that as much as I can so that everybody can also start planning their own financial independence. Yeah, that's great. And uh, one other thing I want to mention before we go is I think you recently donated a couple of my books to the local library. Is that true? Yeah. The Hawaii State <laughs> Public Library System. Now, the, the librarian is keeping some of these for herself at the Miliwani branch. Oh, great. <laughs> but uh, they should be cataloged in a couple of weeks, and then you'll be able to see them anywhere in the Hawaii State Public Library System. You can have interlibrary loan anywhere except New Zealand, but you can get an <laughs> interlibrary loan anywhere in the state of Hawaii. That's excellent. Right? Okay. That's really and, cool. And you'll tell people as they read your book if they're done with that paper copy of the book to just donate it to the local library. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Don't donate it. Give it to a friend, exactly. um, photo, you, photocopy it and send it to someone. But you've uh, heard about the joke. If you love the book, give it to a friend. If you hated the book, give it to an enemy, but pass it on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just keep it moving. And, uh, -huh. uh you can, uh, you can learn more the, about the book on my website, militarymoneymail.com slash book. And Doug, thank you again so much for coming on the podcast. Happy and, to do it, Spencer. And, and thanks again for the book. You, you've written an excellent book there and I really enjoyed reading it. It's been an honor having Doug on the podcast today. We got into lots of great military financial independence topics, post-retirement life, safe withdrawal rates, all kinds of other great topics. A couple of recap points. So Doug retired from the Navy 20 years ago. He's been implementing the 4% safe withdrawal rate strategy during his 20 years of FI, and he's doing just fine. 
like he said, he's got more money than he knows what to do with. Doug also talked about his new book, Raising Money Savvy Kids, and got into the tactics about the kids 401k and using allowance as a type of universal basic income. And we talked about Doug's asset allocation for FI, basically 100% equities, achieving FI in a high cost of living area with kids and Doug's recommended websites and forums. Thanks again, listeners, for joining us today. We appreciate your continued support and for giving us all those delicious five-star reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I think we're almost up to 50 five-star reviews on Spotify, so that's awesome. And for those of you who purchased the book recently, thank you very much. The book is launching on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible very soon, so look for it there. Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom by Spencer Reese. If you search Military Money Manual on Audible or Amazon or Kindle, it should bring it up right away, or you can buy it right now at shop.militarymoneymanual.com. Again, big thanks today to Doug from the-military-guide.com for coming on today and for sharing his experience and expertise with military retirement and financial independence. All of Doug's writing revenue is donated to military charities. And if you reach out to him, you can uh, offer your advice and stories to help write his next edition of the book, which should hopefully be coming out soon. We'll see you next week on the Military Money Manual podcast. Hey guys, it's Spencer again. Before I let you go, I want to let you know about my new book. It's called The Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom. And it's available right now at militarymoneymanual.com slash book. This is the book I wish someone had handed me on my first day in the military. In this book, I cover the exact money tactics, investing strategies I use on my path to financial independence before age 40. I break down the math of FI and I explain the exact dollar amounts you need to retire. The book is full of easy to apply financial advice specifically for military service members and their families. I cover tax-free deployments, the thrift savings plan, and many more topics only military personnel can relate to. This book was written specifically for you, whether you're active duty, guard, reserve, a military spouse, enlisted, or officer. Both E's and O's will benefit from the lessons in the Military Money Manual. If you're in the Army, Navy, or Air Force ROTC, or if you're a cadet or midshipman at West Point, Naval Academy, and the Air Force Academy, this is the perfect book to start your military career with. Again, the book is available right now at militarymoneymanual.com slash book, an audiobook, ebook, and my personal favorite, the hardcover book. The hardcover book was printed right here at home in the United States of America, and it will look great on your bookshelf. So check it out. Let me know what you think. And remember, podcast listeners can use promo code podcast to get a special discount. It's called The Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom, and it's available right now at militarymoneymanual.com slash book. Thanks for listening.